Hey everyone, welcome back to Wicked Deeds. We're your hosts, I'm Brittany. And I'm John. And today's case had me sick to my stomach as I researched the details. When a crime like this happens to someone going about their daily life doing the same things you do, it's tough to not get emotional thinking how easily it could have happened to you. Today's case is about the murder of Kelsey Smith. Kelsey Smith was a vibrant 18-year-old living in Overland Park, Kansas, with her mother Missy and father Greg. She'd just graduated from Shawnee Mission West High School, and I mean just graduated, like nine days earlier. So she was well on her way into adulthood, having big plans to go to University of Kansas in the fall to study veterinary sciences. This particular college was near and dear to both her and her dad because they would always attend the University of Kansas football games together. Throughout high school, Kelsey had excelled in and participated in countless school activities. Most notably was the marching band, which she played the clarinet in. She was incredibly talented, fun, and beautiful. On Saturday night, June 2nd, 2007, Kelsey had plans with her boyfriend, John, to celebrate their six-month anniversary. She didn't want to be empty-handed, so like any other woman, she heads to Target to grab a gift. And I mean, come on, Target really does have everything. It's obviously the best place to go for a gift. (laughs) I suppose. It's noted that she would head over to Target around 7 p.m. that evening. It seems as though the Target near her was either in or across from a mall, so I wonder if that's where she chose to go because she had the option of just going across the street to the mall after if she couldn't find a gift at Target. Regardless, she seemed to get what she needed there because she makes a call to her mom as she's in the store. She's looking for gift wrap and couldn't think of what aisle it might be in. And let me tell you guys, Target back in 2007, that looked real different. I can see why she may have had a hard time looking for the wrapping section, because these stores were not organized like they are today. I can't even remember what they used to look like. All I can remember is how they are now. It's almost like a messier Walmart. Mm, uh, (laughs) Hard to believe that's possible. I know. (laughs) Anyway, she finds what she needs and heads out. However... No one would hear from her after she leaves the store. She wouldn't call or text, didn't show up to meet with John, and didn't show up at home either. Where on earth could she have gone? Everyone is obviously very concerned. They were all calling and texting her, but got nothing back. This was unlike Kelsey. She was incredibly responsible, so her family headed out to start looking for her. John and her sister Lindsay would leave in their car and search the surrounding areas for any sign of Kelsey. Hours would go by with no clues to her whereabouts when they discover her car and just her car, no Kelsey. Now her family knows something is very wrong and they call police to report her missing. The call to police is reported to have taken place around 11 p.m. on June 2nd. So by now, it's been roughly four hours since Kelsey was last seen. Her family stated that they'd seen her between 6.30 and 7 p.m. right before she'd left her home to go to Target. When police arrived at the car, they discovered Kelsey's purse was left inside, and eerily, the gift that she had bought for John, including the wrapping paper for it, was still left on the back seat. Immediately, the family is sure of the fact that she didn't just walk away. Why would she have gone to get this gift and then just vanish out of thin air? It's noted in the See No Evil episode titled We See You, Kelsey, that the authorities and family wanted to open the trunk, but were unable to do so until forensics arrived on scene. And from what I gather, it appeared as though there was a piece of clothing hanging out of the trunk. So, of course, everyone's mind is going to go to the worst place first. I'm surprised the officers on scene didn't open the trunk, even without forensics there. I mean, in my mind, what if someone's in there barely clinging to life, and if you didn't open the trunk, they could die? Whereas if you do, you could save them. I mean, glove up and don't leave prints on anything and open it. Absolutely. I found this to be odd and very frustrating. I mean, what's the point of waiting? I mean, even if they found something, just leave it undisturbed and wait for forensics to continue on. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And side note, what's up with that weird episode name, We See You, Kelsey? What's that supposed to mean? 
great question. I honestly have no clue, and I kind of found it to be a little creepy. When forensics arrive on scene, they open the trunk and find nothing other than the piece of clothing or cloth or whatever it was hanging out of the trunk, and a few other miscellaneous items. Nothing strange or out of the ordinary. So now we're back to square one. Where did they find her car? Ah, I was getting to that. They found it in a Macy's parking lot across the street from Target. That's strange, not too far from where she was last known to be. Yeah, maybe she was just stopping there before she went home. It doesn't seem like she mentioned it to anybody, but I don't know, maybe she had just wanted to stop in and look around before heading out to wrap John's gift. Police had no real leads to go off of at this point, but during their search of the area where Kelsey's car was found, they noticed that there were security cameras in the lot. And all I kept thinking was, please let these cameras work. How many times have we talked about security cameras not working, footage being taped over, or it just conveniently not working the particular day in question? Yeah, very true. Hopefully because these are big businesses, though, then there's no problem with the footage. Yes, and thankfully, they worked. Police had to wait until the next morning to obtain the footage, but the important thing is there was footage they'd be able to review. When police inspect the surveillance video from the Macy's parking lot, it sets off alarm bells. The video shows Kelsey's car pulling into the Macy's parking lot around 9.15 p.m., two hours after Kelsey was last known to have been at the Target. The driver of the vehicle proceeds to park in an area of spaces away from other vehicles and brings the car to rest completely diagonally through the set of spots. I was like, uh, that's weird. My first thought is... If this is Kelsey, maybe she's been drugged or something so she isn't driving normal. If it's not, and it's someone who stole her car or potentially kidnapped her, they're not being very stealthy leaving the car out in the open like that. Wouldn't you think they'd want to hide the car? Especially if they could have left, like, I don't know, traces of themselves in it, like DNA, fingerprints, anything like that? Yeah, if this was someone up to no good, I mean, they could have left the car in the middle of nowhere not across the street from where it was taken from. Something's fishy. Well, as police continue watching the footage, they see the person park the car, shut it off, and exit the vehicle. They then jog away from the car at a brisk pace, seemingly towards another lot. What on earth? Why are you leaving the car there and just running away from it? I'm very confused. They're running from the car because they don't want people to see them with the car. They probably didn't even realize they were being caught on camera. For sure. And as great as it is to have this footage, there's one problem. It's super grainy. You can't tell who the person is exiting the car and really can't determine anything of importance other than the time in which the car shows up in the lot and the fact that the person was wearing a white shirt. You honestly can't even tell if it's male or female leaving the car. That's how poor quality the video footage is. As police are investigating all potential leads, they do what anyone would expect, even though it's annoying. They question the family. That's annoying? Yes, we know they're not involved. Well, then it'll be quick and painless and police can move on. You've got to start with those closest to the victim. Yeah, 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 I know it's a requirement, but think about how frustrating it must have been for them knowing they're not involved and being forced to sit through questioning when all you want to do is find your loved one. I know, I get it, but it's not like all of the police were in questioning them. I'm sure they were still continuing their investigation outside. True, I'll give you that. Police had brought the family in the previous night after they'd called to report Kelsey missing when they found her car. Kelsey's parents and sister are ruled out fairly quickly and police move on. The next obvious person in line for questioning is Kelsey's boyfriend, John. And I know, before you get all it's necessary on me, I get it. Let me drop some knowledge on you. According to an article in The Atlantic, it's determined that, quote, The CDC analyzed the murders of women in 18 states from 2003 to 2014, finding a total of 10,018 deaths. Of those, 55% were intimate partner violence related, meaning they occurred at the hands of a former or current partner or the partner's family or friends. In 93% of those cases, the culprit was a current or former romantic partner, end quote. When I read this, I was like, dang, those statistics are staggering. It hurts my soul to know there are people out there suffering like this because of relationships with clearly toxic people. But let's jump back to Kelsey's story. It seems as though John was the last person to have any contact with Kelsey, so police obviously want to question him and find out if he knows anything about what might have happened to her. 
After a rough interrogation, John is also cleared of any involvement in Kelsey's disappearance. Police would soon obtain the surveillance footage from both the Target parking lot and inside the store to see what else they may be able to uncover. And I discovered something new about my all-time favorite store while researching this case. Apparently, Target is super well-known for its, quote, cutting-edge surveillance, and police were confident they'd be able to clearly make something out even if it was just to see where Kelsey went as she traveled through the store. Authorities would analyze Target's surveillance footage. Their intent was to follow Kelsey throughout the store and attempt to identify anything out of the ordinary. They certainly had their work cut out for them. It was stated that there were at least 40 different cameras covering the store. That immediately makes me think they're going to be able to see almost every move Kelsey makes. As they begin to review the footage, they see Kelsey arrive at the store at 6.54 p.m., walking towards the front doors, wearing a bright pink tank top, black shorts, and a crossbody bag. You can't miss her. She's so easy to spot as she's perusing the store. She continues through the aisles, browsing for a gift for John, and we even see her make that phone call to her mom, asking where the wrapping section is. She seems fine, normal, like absolutely nothing is wrong. She's not in any distress. We see her head to the cashier, check out and pay, and subsequently leave the store and walk back to her car. She's back at her car after spending literally less than 10 minutes in the Target. She backs out of her parking spot and leaves, and that's it, nothing of note. Again, police are now back to square one, 24 hours into the investigation, and they're no closer to finding Kelsey than they were at the start, even though they had all this potentially promising information. How discouraging for not only the family, but police too. I'm sure they were banking on finding something of importance in this footage that could lead them closer to what happened. Yeah, that's definitely rough. You'd have to imagine that there was something in those videos that could at least lead them a bit further. Well, I have a feeling someone couldn't let it go and forced everyone to keep re-watching the footage. Because while doing this, they find something incredibly unsettling. It just took a little more digging, a few more sets of eyes, and everyone in silence paying very close attention. Police find proof that Kelsey was being followed. At first glance, very unsuspiciously, but for sure being followed. As they continue to review the surveillance video, they see a man in a white shirt and black shorts lurking around in nearly every bit of footage that they spot Kelsey in. He's hovering around the ends of aisles, clearly just pretending to shop. It does not look like he's searching for anything in particular, more like he's just aimlessly roaming around the store. And people, we need to pay attention to this kind of thing. Do not get me wrong. I am absolutely not blaming Kelsey for not spotting this creep. She probably didn't even notice him. And for good reason. I mean, he kept his distance at all times. And if you aren't expecting someone to be stalking you, you likely aren't going to be aware of what's going on. This makes me think back a couple of years when... We were hearing about those people going around Targets, of all places, giving little kids stickers, which turned out to be like a marking system for child abductors. Oh my god, I remember that. That is absolutely terrifying. You almost have to always think that someone's out to get you to protect yourself. The number one thing I always stand by and honestly hope everyone would or at least starts doing is just keeping your eyes peeled. Don't have your phone in your face while you're walking through the store. Stay with whoever you came to the store with. Keep your eye on people there and just make a mental note of anyone who just feels off. They may not be creepy or planning anything, but you need to be in control if anything were to happen. Just always pay attention to your surroundings. That's what I'm trying to get at. But I digress. Let's get back to this footage the police are reviewing. So they see this guy following her around and figure they need to keep a close eye on him now. Like I mentioned before, Kelsey was only in the target for about 10 minutes, so it's not a ton of footage for police to watch before they see Kelsey leave the store. But wait, where is this guy now? Oh yeah, he rushed to the front of the store when he saw Kelsey start the checkout process. So he leaves the store before she does. You see him walk out, head over to the left-hand side of the parking lot. And then, a minute or two later, we see Kelsey leave the store. This is the part of Kelsey's story that shocked me and had my stomach in knots. In the video, we see Kelsey head to her car. Now, mind you, this camera was a fairly good distance away from her car, so... Even though it's decent quality, it's not like police are seeing this transpire in crystal clear quality, but it's good enough that they can still get a pretty decent visual of what she's doing. She opens the back door, drops her items on the back seat, and closes the door. She walks around the back of her car towards the driver's side. 
she opens her driver's door and then, out of nowhere, a flash across the screen. It was so quick, barely even noticeable unless you were looking for it. And then the car pulls out of the parking spot and leaves the lot. So what was the flash? You'll never guess. It was the same guy from in the store freaking sprinting across the lot to Kelsey and her car. We come to find out that he grabs her, shoves her into the car, gets in the seat behind her, and forces her to leave the lot. Wow, that's crazy. I was literally sick to my stomach as I'm watching it. I couldn't even believe how quickly it happened. A split second and she was gone. She probably had no idea what was even happening. It was all so fast. This guy 100% had this plan the whole time his creepy ass was watching her in Target. Oh, absolutely. He was totally stalking her and planning out this abduction. And then when he saw her cashing out, he went outside to lie in wait. So now, what kind of information were police able to gather from their newfound suspect? Well, we know that they had surveillance from the Macy's parking lot showing that someone dropped Kelsey's car off and then ran out of frame. Police deduced that the direction their suspect was running towards would have led them back towards the target. Investigators continue to look through the target surveillance around the time of the sighting at Macy's and boom. They see the suspect come back into frame in the target lot and enter a dark colored pickup truck. This is police's big break in the case and now we need to know who this psycho is that kidnapped Kelsey. They need to find them and question them as soon as possible. Was Kelsey still alive? Had something terrible happened? The clock was ticking and they needed answers and fast. Police waste no time and blow up a still frame image of this guy as he was seen leaving Target and circulated everywhere. To describe the image, he looks like a thin, probably like 5'10", 5'11", white male with dark hair and potentially a goatee. He's wearing a white t-shirt, dark colored shorts, and what I think look to be Converse sneakers, like the low top ones. A photo of this is on our socials if you want to take a look. As a side note, in case you were wondering, that footage where investigators saw the suspect dropping off Kelsey's car at Macy's and then running towards the target? Yeah, that person was wearing the same outfit as this guy. So there's no confusion as to whether or not they're looking for the right person. Police also now know what the perp's car looks like. So they go back to the target footage to see if they can locate this person as they arrive at target earlier in the evening. And lo and behold, They see him pulling in a very short time before Kelsey did. Once police put the word out about what was going on and their picture of the suspect made its rounds, they're bombarded with tips from people who believe they know the guy. Several of the tips that came in pointed at a man named Edwin Hall. Even some of his co-workers and friends were pretty positive that it was him, as were several of his neighbors. When police went to his home to bring him in for questioning, this freaking guy is packing his truck. Yeah, you heard that right. He was packing his truck like he was going to flee the area with his wife and four-year-old son. You heard that one right, too. Their prime suspect in this kidnapping is a father and a husband. How sickening. Jeez, how old was this guy? He was 26 at the time of Kelsey's murder. As police question him, right off the bat, Edwin denies any and all involvement in the kidnapping. He's steadfast in his denial and will not give the cops any information. But over time, he starts to break. He tells police he saw her in the store and remembered specifically that he, quote, liked her legs, end quote. Ew, what a piece of garbage. That's what he remembers and that's what he tells investigators? Well, by this time, police have had enough of his antics and show their hand. They tell Edwin that they have proof it was him. Little did this scumbag know, Forensics had dusted Kelsey's car for prints after it had been located. And you guessed it, they had a match to Edwin Hall's prints inside Kelsey's car. Once police lay it all out there, Hall cracks and tells authorities everything. The story he tells is essentially that of what police had already pieced together based on the surveillance footage, but now we have the missing specifics. Hall admits to following her around, tells us about the fact that he liked her legs, and goes on to divulge that he had been armed with a handgun. He confirmed that the flash that was seen in the surveillance footage while Kelsey was entering her car was him. He'd come flying across the parking lot, gun in hand, grabbing Kelsey and forcing her into her car at gunpoint. He proceeds to get into the back seat behind her and forces her to leave the parking lot, unsure of what'll happen to her. I can only imagine how absolutely terrified Kelsey was, 
I am disgusted that there are people like Edwin Hall in this world. And no, I'm not naive to the fact that there really are monsters like this living among us. It's just one of those things that just crushes you when you hear about it. Every time something like this happens, it's just yet another blow to my hope for humanity. I know what you mean. When people are put in positions like Kelsey, you have no time to think. You can only react. And in cases like this, it's almost better to try and flee and risk being shot at. More times than not, that gun's probably there for coercion. The goal of these assailants is to get you somewhere secluded, so they can then do what they want. Screw that. Run, scream, cause a scene. That's the last thing that these people want to happen. I totally agree. And for all we know, Edwin Hall didn't even know how to shoot a gun. He's got it there for a scare tactic. And you've said that to me a million times before about running and causing a scene, but I just think about how I might react in that situation if it happened to me. And I just don't know if my mind would like work quickly enough to register that that's what I should be doing. Yeah, I get it. You just have to try and keep in your mind that going with this person is worst case scenario. Trying to escape in public, regardless of what happens, will have a better outcome than obeying orders and allowing them to have full control once they get you alone. Yeah, that's great advice, and I just hope I never have to put that to use. Unfortunately, this story only gets worse. Up until this point, no one knows where Kelsey is or what's happened to her. Her family is doing everything they can to obtain her cell phone records to see if they can determine where her phone last pinged and maybe discover her whereabouts. But apparently, Verizon decided to be difficult and wouldn't release the information right away. It took them three days to provide the records. Once Kelsey's last known location from the pings were in hand, authorities would locate what they'd hoped they wouldn't have to. Kelsey's body would be found within just one hour of having that cellular information. And I'm sorry, but is this a sick joke? The Smiths were forced to suffer days longer than necessary because of whatever limitations Verizon had, causing them to take so long to get Kelsey's coordinates? I call BS. I'm with you. If the cell phone provider could gather the information within a few days... I'm sure it could have been completed that same day under these circumstances. It's just a bad situation. Continuing on, it's unclear whether Edwin told police this next part in his initial confession or if it's brought to light later. Hall states he forced Kelsey to drive a fair distance to a wooded area where he proceeds to rape and strangle her to death. During the initial reports of the killing, there were no indications towards what the murder weapon may have been, just that cause of death was ligature strangulation. We later find out that Hall had used Kelsey's own belt to kill her, even though he had a firearm in his possession. This despicable person wanted the killing to be intimate for some reason. They didn't even know each other. There was no reason for malice. Kelsey was a young, innocent girl who did not deserve to be targeted by this monster. It goes to show you that this guy has some serious issues, especially knowing that these two had never met each other. And after the fact that we found out Hall told the police that he went after her because he liked her legs. I know, it's absolutely disgusting. Like, is that your criteria for choosing a victim? It 100% goes to show he has some significant issues to choose to act on this compulsion. We can only guess what goes through the minds of people like this. Once the media gets a hold of this information, they do as they do. They become fascinated with the killer and begin doing a deep dive into Edwin Hall's life to try and figure out how he came to be this cold-blooded killer. At the time, Hall was 26 years old and, like we mentioned earlier, had a wife and son. Did they have any idea they were living with this deviant? As the case attracts more attention, questions regarding Hall's past and what other crimes he may have committed start to pop up. I would guess that, like with most murderers, his past was riddled with indicators that something wasn't right and eventually culminated with this killing. Exactly, and some of Hall's backstory would be revealed after his arrest. Edwin Hall was arrested and charged with first-degree premeditated murder, which puts the death penalty on the table. But, unfortunately, the prosecution cuts him a deal to avoid execution, if he agrees to provide a full confession. And I mean... I guess I can understand why they'd want to do this and avoid the heartbreaking situation of going through a trial, but that's just going to be so tough to deal with for the Smith family and Kelsey's friends to know this guy still gets to live the rest of his life, even if it is in a cement box. I get where you're coming from, and I'd hope that the prosecution consulted the family before coming to that decision. I'm not sure if that's how it goes, but it'd be kind enough to give the family the option to choose Hall's fate. Absolutely. I'm 
not entirely sure if that's what happens here, but I feel like they are definitely happy that justice is being served and this guy cannot harm another person again. Once Hall accepted his plea deal, he would go on to confess everything in Kelsey's murder. After entering the guilty plea, Hall's attorney goes on to paint this picture of his client's life and how the hardships he endured should somehow minimize his guilt and perhaps reduce the severity of his sentence. Oh, please, like anyone cares about what happened to him in his past at this point. He stalked a young girl, raped, and murdered her. There's nothing anyone can say to excuse what he's done. Yep, and Hall's attorney tells the court that Edwin had been molested as a young child by his uncle, and that set him in a downward spiral as he grew up. Oh, sure, like that gives you total free reign to wreak havoc on those around you. I don't think so. We learn that Edwin Hall was adopted around the age of seven by Don and Carol Hall. They stated to the Emporia Gazette that it was evident Edwin had been having a tough life and thought they could make a difference. During the years of living with his adopted parents, Edwin became more and more problematic. In 1994, he was caught taking his father's truck without permission. In 1995, caught stealing. And then, in 1996, he was convicted of threatening his sister with a knife. This was the last straw for Don and Carol, and Edwin would be removed from the home. Okay, so he clearly had issues as a child, and as he grows older towards adulthood, things just continue to escalate. He starts by being defiant, and at least with this family, his actions progress to him threatening death or bodily harm towards his sister. To me, it's obvious that things are only going to get worse. Yeah, generally things don't get better unless there's some type of serious intervention. But when someone like this has an ever-increasing pattern of violence, it's only a matter of time until a real tragedy occurs. And unfortunately, Kelsey was his target. Who knows what other crimes he could have committed while growing up that maybe he was never caught for. For sure. And there is a lot of speculation surrounding the fact that he may have committed more crimes in the past. But either whoever he harmed didn't come forward or, for all we know, he could have killed before and was able to keep it a secret. Even though I'm not entirely sure I agree with that because, I mean, this guy was blatantly on camera stalking a girl who he then proceeds to kill. He really doesn't seem like the brightest killer in my mind if this is how he's acting. He was pretty nonchalant about it. Don't you agree? I do agree. I don't know if I'd go as far as saying he's killed before, but I definitely bet that he was involved in some other type of criminal activity. And that's not even the last of it. With all the attention surrounding the murder of Kelsey Smith, everyone is on the hunt to dig up information about Hall's past outside of what his attorney wanted to portray. It's discovered that Hall had a MySpace account under the alias Jack, which seems weird and makes you think, uh, okay, was this actually his account? But according to several neighbors, that's apparently a name he went by. And based on the profile picture used, as well as the account being listed under a now-known alias, authorities confirm it to be Edwin Hall's. This account would be very telling as to the type of sick person he is. In his bio, it shows his interests as, quote, eating small children and harming small animals, end quote. Uh, what? He has a small child, a four-year-old son. If I were his wife and I saw that, you bet your butt I wouldn't be letting him see my kid anymore. I couldn't find much to state if his wife, whose name is Aletha, had stood by him. She was in court when he was sentenced, but not sure if maybe the defense attorney advised that that was a good idea for her to show face at the sentencing. During Hall's sentencing hearing, he apologizes to the family for his actions. His words are, and I quote, I can't find the right words to say today. I am so sorry for what I have done. That's it. That's all I can say. End quote. No way, buddy. You aren't sorry. You're just sorry you got caught. During this hearing is when his defense attorney tries to paint that picture of him being an abused child, and that's why he is who he is today and that his upbringing is what brought him to commit such terrible acts. We already know that he was adopted by a good family that tried to make a difference in his life, and it didn't help. This guy was going to end up where he is today because he's a loose cannon and has no regard for others. I totally agree. But ooh, let me tell you, Missy Smith, Kelsey's mom, was not having it. She destroys Edwin Hall in court. She tells him that she too knows what it's like to be abused, to grow up with alcoholic parents, be molested as a child, be a victim of rape. She makes it clear that she too had a difficult life, 
but she didn't use it as an excuse to cause harm to others. She says, quote, but I also know that life is about choices. When does one have to take responsibility for their own life? End quote. Yes, Missy, you tell them. As I was researching and reading her impact statement, I was so impressed by her. What a strong, amazing woman. I love that she just shoved his own words right back into his mouth like this. He deserves to feel like absolute trash for what he's done. And she's right. Life is about choices. Your lived experiences are not what make you a good or bad person. It's how you manage them and come to form your own future. 100%. I live by those words every day. I always say you are the most important person in your life and you have to make your own choices and you'll never change if you don't want to change. Missy's mom goes on to state that, quote, Hall should not be able to see his child again since we cannot see ours, end quote. Yes, another one for Missy. I 100% agree with this statement too. He is an absolute monster, a cruel, evil human being and does not deserve to see his child, especially after taking the life of someone else's. But let's move on. We've given Hall more time than he's deserved. He took the life of a beautiful young woman in Kelsey. She's the reason we're covering this case. And it's important that we take away something from her story. And Kelsey's family feels the same. We, as women, need to be cognizant of our surroundings and not forget how easy it is to fall into a false sense of safety. Kelsey was in her hometown in a very public space while it was still light out. She likely never would have expected anything like this to happen, especially to her. We always feel like these things can't happen to us, but the truth is they can, and they happen far too often. The types of people that commit these terrible acts have no regard for others. We have to do our best to never let our guards down, as unfair as that is, it's reality. If Kelsey's story has taught us anything, it's that someone you don't even know could be lurking around the corner just waiting for an opportunity to harm you. I'll be the first to admit, I don't love going out to stores by myself, and you will likely never catch me out and about alone when it's dark out if I can help it. But when I do go out alone, I do my best to keep a close eye on my surroundings. I'll watch people in stores. I don't care if they think I'm staring, I probably am. I want to be sure these people around me aren't up to no good. And if someone is making you feel uncomfortable, call them out for it. Hopefully, it'll startle them enough to know you're paying attention and they'll leave you be. And when I walk to my car, I'll constantly be looking around as I pack my stuff into the trunk. And as soon as I get in the car, I'm locking my doors. I don't sit on my phone. I buckle up and get on out of there. Maybe it's just me, but these days, the less I can be out in public, the better. There will always be evil people out there, but the best we can do is take these small steps to try and protect ourselves and minimize our chances of being a target. As we wrap up today's case, I wanted to bring up a little bit more about Kelsey's family. After Kelsey was killed, they established the Kelsey Smith Foundation in her memory and have been doing amazing things. They travel the country speaking and teaching people how to protect themselves. Self-defense is such a vital tool in situations like this, and I think it's so important to know how to fend for yourself in the unfortunate case that you're forced to fight off an attacker. Not only have they spoken to and taught young women all over the country, but they've also been pushing for the Kelsey Smith Act throughout the United States. I'd mentioned earlier on in our story that Verizon had withheld Kelsey's phone records for three days after she went missing, and when the family was finally able to obtain the records, they found Kelsey's body literally within the hour of when they were able to trace that last ping from her phone. The Kelsey Smith Act would make it so that cell phone carriers are required to provide authorities with the last known location of an individual's cell phone in case of emergency. It has been passed in 30 states across the country. Let's hope that they can get the rest of them on board over the coming years so we can see this act assist in stopping similar situations from occurring. The work they've done with the Kelsey Smith Act has already aided in one case in Tennessee in 2012, where a young child was saved after being abducted because they were able to obtain phone records right away. And this is just one instance of many. It's obvious that Kelsey left a lasting impression on those around her. And as painful as losing her has been to friends and family, they have not let her die in vain. They will carry on her legacy through awareness and advocacy and will continue to do good in her name. (laughs) 
Thank you all so much for tuning in every week. We're so happy to have you here. Make sure to leave us a five-star review before you go and follow us on our socials. You can follow us on Instagram at wicked.deeds.podcast and on Twitter at Wicked Deeds. Don't forget to visit our website, wickeddeedspodcast.com, to take a look at any photos from this episode and view our source material. But most importantly, tune in next week for an all-new episode. <laughs>